Anyway, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about AI. Like you haven't heard anything about AI for a year, so we're still going to talk about it. Um, but I wanted to uh, set the stage a little bit and tell you a little bit about what we've learned over the past couple of years in talking to enterprises that are trying to build value through AI and uh, what, they, what they're trying to do and what they're facing. Um, and what's happened is there's been this movement away from, fairly, I call it fairly difficult AI, where you need data scientists and some very big brains to, to manipulate things to the chat GPT era where we had the democratization, I hate to say that again, of, of AI where you can speak to something, speak to a deep learning model in, in natural language and it will do something. So that's changed a lot of things. Uh, and what I think has been interesting for me, and when it, we're going to talk again about here, the panel, we're going to talk a little bit about what they've learned, and they're going to introduce themselves in a second. But I'll give you some key highlights, I think, are things that have been important for operationalizing AI and getting value out of AI for companies. And that is that you, um, you have to understand the product life cycle of it, that it's not just a one-time software development piece. That's one thing. Uh, you have to understand that you have people and processes in place that can um, move the, that through your organization is another thing that seems to be a key piece. And um, maybe corporate culture is another piece that uh, you have to be willing to do, you know, experiment. We're gonna hear a little bit about that. And finally, there's risk and uh, managing risk is important and how to manage risk, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit. One other piece, and I wanna to touch on that when we're, we're talking here, is uh, building trust. Because it, when you have a corporate, when you have customers, you have shareholders, and you're trying to, you have this very unknown piece going forward, how do you build trust so that customers trust it uh, and your shareholders are confident in what you're doing. So that's the s stage. I'm gonna ask my uh, panelists, because I've got Paula and J Jay to my right, Paula to his right, um, and I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves uh, real quick. And then the first question is gonna be about how they're using AI today. So Jay. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, my name's Jay Jackson. I'm the CEO of Abacus Life. We're a publicly traded company. Uh, recently publicly traded, we went public this summer. And we focus both on the origination of life insurance contracts, but not in the traditional way that you might think. Uh, and we are also the alternative asset manager. So we're the market maker as well as the asset manager of these policies. In short order, we actually purchase the policies directly from either the policy holder or the insurance agent and advisor. Uh, and what we do is we calculate the current net present value of that life insurance contract. Um, and, and a simple way to think about it is that when you buy a life insurance policy at some point in the future, you think that policy might be worth, let's say, a million dollars upon a mortality event. What we do is that we calculate what the current net present value is, and we do that by the foundation, and to your point in relationship to AI, is we reestablish or we set the current lifespan for that individual by getting updated medical files, reviewing those updated medical files, analyzing those, and then looking at really large data sets to help understand what that individual's lifespan is, which can then set the valuation for what that life insurance policy is in today's value. Uh, and it's, it's a growing industry. It's, it's about a $13 trillion industry. But one interesting fact about that industry is that 90% or nine out of 10 life insurance policies never pay a claim. And it's mainly because people just stop paying on them. Now, most of us in the room, we kind of might look around and say, well, why, why would that ever happen? Well, when you're 75 years old and you start to downsize other aspects of your life, specifically financially, um, they look at life insurance like debt, not equity. Um, and their children might be in their 40s or 50s at that point. And what we do is, I think, fairly simple, is that now we come back in and we say, hey, your policy has an actual market value. It's your asset. Let's discover what it is. And the first step to that is understanding what lifespan uh, you might have. And that's where utilizing large language models, Neuralinks, uh, et cetera, to advance that process. Because if all of you really quickly think about how many probabilities that have occurred in your life or that may occur in your lifetime, it's in the billions. Not one single computer can simply calculate all of those outcomes at once. It takes, used to take months, now weeks, and now actually was, was weeks and now 
days, and now actually, uh, with our use of AI, it takes seconds. Um, so we can spend some more time on that as we evolve, but I wanted to give you an outlay on some of the things that we're gonna talk about, some of the things we're doing uh, in the public markets with this kind of data. NASDAQ ticker, please. Oh, yes, NASDAQ, A-B-L. Thank you, Paula. Please, please take a look. <laughs> okay, I'm Paula Baumgart. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Veriget. And please bear with me, um, public speaking, I'm an IT person, public speaking is so outside my comfort zone. <laughs> so anyhow, um, we are a charter operator. Uh, we specialize in short hops. Um, our planes are carbon fiber, so they don't have the metal, t metal fatigue issues of the bigger planes like the Challengers and Hawkers. They're incredibly fuel efficient. They're single engine, single pilot. They're able to fly into more than 5,400 airports across the country, not just the 29 hubs of misery that you're all familiar with, with commercial aviation. All right, we use um, our artificial intelligence. Um, we have um, several things uh, going on. Uh, behind the scenes, we have our, our aircraft schedule that we're constantly running through our optimizer engine to um, make the schedule more efficient, uh, reduce the number of empty miles we're flying, uh, reduce carbon, and then during the day, things happen, trips get sold, so we have to rejigger the schedule, or a plane goes down and we have to change things around, so we're constantly updating the schedule. In the real world out there, other charter companies, when they have something like that happen, if they don't have this AI technology, it will literally take them hours to rework their schedule. Mm -hmm. If they're lucky, it may even take longer than, than that. And then on the quoting side, we have um, an online quoting and booking engine. And with that, we're able to um, look up um, airports by, you can put in a landmark, you can put in your address, zip code. Um, if you know the airport code, you can, you can put that in. Um, we will give you the closest airport and we will also give you a list of other nearby airports. There are a lot of people out there that don't know um, that, for example, Teterboro, it's an awful airport to fly in and out of. S specifically, private charter, it's really bad. Um, but there are a lot of airports very close to it where you don't have all the headaches that you do at mm. Teterboro. So, you know, we'll show you alternatives rather than just a specific airport that you request. Interesting. Yes. So you'll notice uh, process automation is a big deal for AI. It's where you can really leverage things. Uh, I think the most uh, ROI comes from those kinds of things. It's just my comment. We'll hear more. Um, so I want to ask you guys to tell us a little bit about the AI journey you went through, Jay. And you start there and say the, kind of the timeline. What was your company's process and ideation? Sure. And, and to your point, specifically around ROI, uh, utilizing AI and really for us, large language models um, made us more profitable. I mean, it really went to the bottom line. And I think that, you know, as one of the few small cap growth companies out there, we, we're, we're, we actually are profitable uh, that has a tech run on it. Uh, but in addition to that, we've been profitable every year for 20 years. So as the underlying asset was already in foundation, was already there. Uh, now it was a matter of how do we make it more efficient. And if you think about the medical industry specifically, uh, it, it's very antiquated and still is. So is the life insurance industry. I think there's still some carriers that operate via fax. My point is, is that what we had to do was we would go out and get updated medical records for each individual, and that might be from five different physicians. You had to request them manually. They would sometimes come in the mail and they would be in hard copy, and then you had to scan them into a PDF, and then they had to be manually, physically read by an individual. Um, now, as technology has evolved and developed, you can start to do different PDF readers, but it was really hard to interpret things like physician's notes mm -hmm. and the impact that those might have. And then you could start to train, though, your scan to understand what those are. To give you an advancement of where we are today, that very lengthy manual process uh, just three years ago, when we really started down this process, really four, four years ago, we take on average about six weeks uh, to get complete. And so then we would go back to that policyholder or that individual and say, you know, Mr. Mrs. Mrs. Jones, you are a 78 year old with these following impairments, therefore, and your family history and demographics, et cetera, your lifespan is 10.8 years. 
Um, and it was a very manual, human-driven process, whereas today, we can pull the electronic bench for what we have, those might be pharmaceutical reports, et cetera, uh, and also then still, unfortunately, still have to many times manually go get those medical files. But once we get them, they're all unorganized from separate physicians. Now we upload it, it scans it instantly, and it reorganizes it, puts it in chronological order. So you've got 500 pages now by physician in chronological order, and then reads and picks off by whatever parameters we set, such as ICD codes, family history, and it gives you a summary in about 30 seconds. And then you could take that, and now you can make fundamental underwriting decisions in a very fast, efficient way. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you that the number of policies we're able to acquire on our balance sheet is grown 5x over the same time period. So there is a direct correlation to how you can use AI just in that uh, process piece. But I think once you get the data, it's data in, data out in any type of technology. And what you're able to do here is that when you're thinking about probabilities, now it remembers versus a human bias that may forget. And what I mean by that is, is that, let's say, for example, you've got somebody with kidney disease, diabetes, a BMI over 30. What is their excess mortality rate related to COVID? It's massive. Well, in the early 2020 time period, we were adjusting our tables and we could pick that off because we were able to see, based upon these certain three things that everyone had historically, you started to see excess mortalities happen to occur on those over the age of 75. So that type of data and that type of processing is incredibly useful in a lot of ways, but what does it also tell you? Well, I don't want to give it all away, but it can also tell you how to not, not live longer, but live healthier, right? Um, you know, I always tell people I'm a ton of fun at a party, uh, you know, so they're talking about mortalities all the time. Yeah, I'm happy to come to your next, next, <laughs> next event. But here's just a, a, a few interesting facts. If you cure cancer, cure it. Do you have any idea how long lifespan expands or extends? Right about 3.2 years. If you cure every disease known to humankind, every one of them, you know how far lifespan expands? 4.6. There's never been a centurion over six foot tall. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> You're not living to 100. You're just not. So get that out of your mind and start thinking about statistically what you can do. And that's what we do at our business, is we start to think about, hey, let's start with the most important foundations, financial. Financial has a massive impact on your longevity. Understanding what the value of your life insurance policy is super important in that, because it could mean on average a few hundred, three hundred, three million dollars to your portfolio. Secondly, why are you using a target date fund for 2035 when you have no idea what that means? However, if you know that your anticipated life expectancy is 12 years, wouldn't it make sense to allocate your ETF strategy to 12 years or something close to it? So there's some real life applications here that I think that as we continue to expand and understand what lifespan is and how to predict it, utilizing AI and being able to do it, make it very efficient and easy is where we're going to go. And I think when we hear about AI, we, we hear fear, we hear risk, we hear problems, we hear concerns, we hear Terminator. What we don't talk about are things like this that are gonna have a material impact on all of us in a very, very important way, in a significant way to make your life more efficient, to make it smarter, to make it more valuable. So what you're saying is we should eat our vegetables, is that right? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, 100%. Sure. Eat um, your vegetables, drink less, your, exercise. I mean, this isn't tough. No. Um, Paula, how about plot process for you guys? What was kind of the timeline when you started to look at this in AI? <laughs> Well, um, about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's multiple sales channels for a charter company. Uh, we have brokers that call us, we get emails, um, we get um, uh, data feeds from some other online uh, service providers. And we tackled the email request and we tried to, uh, with legacy AI, read these emails that were coming into us. Um, they're free form. There's no, there's no format to them. There was no easy way to pick out, hey, this guy wants to go from MIA to TEB for some reason, and, and on this date and with these passengers. And uh, we, after six months of development, we ended up giving up on that project. Now we are working with IBM, uh, Watson X, and we are uh, on on a project now, and we hope to have it up in life uh, very soon. Right. I hope you guys didn't notice that uh, the 
financial news recently that a few of our friends have been showing profits based on AI. Uh, so uh, interesting that IBM is one of them. Um, okay, let's go to the next thing and talk about this. Jay, if you could talk a little bit about there's people and processes involved with AI mm -hmm. when, when you looked at it, when you operationalize it. What, what would you say, are, what's an important learning you found from your, your company's experience with that? Sure, I, I, I think the implementation, and, and I would say more, it was less about the consumer trust than the internal trust of the data, right? Because when you're starting to incorporate AI, one of the things we do is that we put out publicly uh, on our, even on our website, and we run probably, I don't know, 80 television commercials a week with our, our own internal calculator. And it's a calculator that was effectively, we wanted it to adapt every single day based upon the valuations that we were seeing and changes we were seeing both in mortality as well as um, cost and, and interest rates, et cetera. Uh, and the implementation of, of that data and then sharing that data with um, an AI-based uh, platform is that are you able, to, how are you fact checking that data, <laughs> right? Uh, because you can get inconsistencies in that data and, and then understanding what's the best way to fact check it. Like you can't just go in blindly and assume, oh wow, I wrote this amazing algorithm that's gonna solve all these things and then not follow up on that algorithm um, to ensure that consistently cross-checking the outputs. And so I, I think that, you know, one of the lessons we learned in that process was, you know, really, and still today, consistently fact-checking the AI that we do use. Um, it, you know, we also tried it with our uh, customer service representatives who typically work with policyholders and agents and advisors. Um, and there were parts of it that made sense. There were some great intuitive things that made a lot of sense when they were typing. However, it, you know, having a microphone in someone's ear of a potential bot um, was an epic fail. Uh, just because I think it was so distracting, it, it, it dehumanized what we need to mm -hmm. do here, right? We, we still have to have, I think, a human ability to communicate, particularly when you're dealing with financial transactions or seniors or other, other types of, of that part of society. And um, as, as we looked at it, I'm, I'm glad ultimately we went just focused specifically on what would benefit us, but most importantly, we really focused on what was gonna be profitable. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't profitable, we dropped that segment. We're like, look, that sounds cool, but it's not making us money, we're out. And we just said, okay, if we can optimize the process, start there, and because this AI world is massive and there's so much that you'll want to do, I would say target two or three that you can do and execute really, really well, uh, and then kind of uh, add on to that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Paula, lessons learned, what you, peoples and processes. Well, um, I've been in the industry a long time and garbage in, garbage out still applies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the type of jet that we fly is a relatively new jet. There was not a lot of flight history for, for this aircraft. And in the early days of the company, uh, we purchased a um, database that contained the flight history for every trip one of these jets made. And it, we were using it to do data mining to calculate flight times between airports uh, so we could rapidly quote trips. And what we found is that uh, this data, a lot of it was really rough and we had to iterative, iterative well, we had yeah, repeatedly iterative. go through yeah. <laughs> and um, clean it up, filter out this, filter out that, get rid of all the noise before we finally got the data to a place where it was clean that we could use it um, to teach our AI to calculate the flight times. Interesting, yep. Data is the new oil, as they say, is that right? Um, so, you both touched on this a little bit. We'll do this really quick. There's legacy AI, generative AI. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if you were working on AI before October of 2022. <laughs> uh, how did generative AI change your path? You talked about that a little bit, but can you talk a little bit? Sure. Um, it, it, it certainly changed our path for a couple reasons. One, um, you know, we were using our, you know, you had to be really, really thoughtful around building your code initially. Um, with generative AI, you could actually just ask ChatGPT what it, where it found a problem in your code. Like, there was some really interesting aspects that accelerated our advancement of AI technology, how we were looking at lifespan distribution curves, all of those things. And, and 
even today, like even when it comes to marketing, um, you, you know, you can look at my bio on LinkedIn, AI hey, wrote it. Uh, I think it's awesome. <laughs> it's far better. I've, I'm not knocking my marketing team, but I think that, you know, it was well done. Uh, so he, 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 it definitely is there. Again, it's a little intimidating initially because you're going, okay, I've been doing things our way, just learning large language models, processing really massive sets of data, and now I'm going to rely a little bit more on this other source. I think some of the things we had to get really comfortable with is, is that, you know, what was this generative AI service, what were they going to do with our data, right? And so we couldn't use, like, medical data and things like that inside of it, but when it came to certain algorithms and code that we felt like even if somebody got, they couldn't really figure out how to apply it, that made a lot of sense to us. So generative AI gave us the ability to, as I highlighted, fact check um, a little bit, uh, and it just added another element, not entirely. You still have to have two or three people cons consistently there verifying what you're working on, how it's being, uh, what the outputs are, do they make sense, is there any, you, you know, um, hallucinations, as they call them, uh, which mm -hmm. I, I honestly, yeah, do happen. Um, but I would argue they happen to everyone here in this room. So, like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all treated, treated the same way. Got it. Paula? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we were using legacy AI for, mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, you know, we had Richard and I uh, worked together at um, another company before he founded Verija, um, and it was all legacy and AI. And as I mentioned, we tackled that problem with the, you know, reading emails to uh, quote trips and, and couldn't do it with just standard AI. And with this, um, with the event, advent of the generative AI, mm -hmm. uh, we're able to uh, feed these emails and, and get the, the data that we need to call our APIs to, to get quotes and return uh, the responses back to uh, the sender Interesting. in English language. Yeah. Great. Last question is going to be, uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to advise this group in talking about how to build corporate value, how to build customer value, what, what would you tell them about your AI experience and how would they do that? Um, a, for us, building corporate value is about making sure that it's profitable, right? And, and, and so if you're going to focus on an AI component of your business strategy, you, part of that strategy must, can, must include a, a timeline and a profitability, right? If it's not going to be additive, um, then maybe it's not best suited for your business right now. Um, there could be other things that you could be focusing on as a company and a business to drive value and to drive revenue. So, you know, our mindset is, A, first and foremost, is this profitable, is this additive? Are we increasing uh, profit revenue and making the process more efficient? Uh, first and foremost. It, otherwise, frankly, if that wasn't the case and we weren't gaining a significant edge in data, we wouldn't use it. So are, just to be clear, you're yeah. saying top line over bottom line necessarily? Uh, no, I'm saying bottom line bottom over line. top line. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure I am. Um, yeah, thank you for the clarification. For us, it's always bottom line. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think in this market uh, that we're faced with as a public company, uh, I think every CEO of every public company should be thinking that way. Um, particularly when they're going to be deploying significant resources into a technology that uh, they may or may not be familiar with. There are great companies out there that can help you do it. You know, measuring what's the quickest route to that bottom line income. Um, you, you, investors are going to hold you accountable now more than ever. And, and I think that if you have bottom line income in any project that you do, or to a certain extent, or certainly a plan to get there in a reasonable amount of time, then, then you're going to be successful. We're going to get to Paula for the last one. I'll give you this, too. We've been advising our, our public company clients to make sure that you have a, a way to talk about this. Uh, that's another very important thing that we found, that there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace about what AI does and what it doesn't do, and that there are themes that you talk about that, that need to be uh, explain to all different types of uh, all different types of communities, whether it's shareholders or customers or anything else. So, mm -hmm. Paula. Okay. Um, in, internally, uh, we're we're a privately held company. So, uh, but internally, we have uh, you know the sales team, operations team. You know, they're used to doing things a certain way, and and change in technology is is scary for them. Mm. And we find that by getting them involved in in setting up the system and using the system that they're, they're more 
um, uh, able to adapt it, mm -hmm. adapt it. Got it, perfect. All right, well, thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate thanks, your time.